Hey, Shalawan family. So today we're going to be discussing these two individuals right here. Um, most of you have probably seen this image on the internet in the description that are given, you know, regarding these two uh, persons. So, um, you know, most of us heard and seen that these are supposedly the last so-called, you know, full-blooded Aztecs, right? But have we really done our research to verify all this? And, uh, you know, can we be sure of what we're, we're, we're seeing? Because, you know, first of all, you know, last full-blooded Aztecs, you know, you're still here. So that's false. All right. So let's, I just want to talk about the, uh, the history, the truth about these two uh, persons uh, in this video. Um, you know, now obviously they have woolly, curly hair, right? Coarse hair. And, you know, these people, you know, resemble more a so-called Negro than any modern day Native American or Aztec of today. All right. And uh, so we've, that's why we've seen this image a lot in certain websites. Like it says here in the description, 19th century Aztec couple. And it says a Mexican tribe now practically extinct by Holton Dutch collection. All right. So that's we're going deb to debunk all this. All right. So again. All right. So these two uh, individuals were also known as the Aztec Lilliputians or the, you know, the little people, the little small people. All right. And it says here, like it says in Wikipedia Commons, the Aztec Lilliputians by Hans Kranz, 1853. And this would be a close up of the image that we just saw. All right, of um, these uh, so-called last Aztecs, Aztec Lilliputans. Again, as we can see here in the uh, British Library, uh, we see the image here. We see the little small Lilliputans. All right, what does it say? It says the Aztec Lilliputans. All right, from the great and mysterious city of Ishimaya in Central America. All right, we're gonna look into that, really, huh? We're gonna look into that. All right in Aztecs who will appear upon the stage for one night only all right and it says check the look at the image right here this is it says in the course of the evening these extraordinary Lilliputans the Aztecs all right so look at the image all right you see what they see so-called Negro these are so-called Negroes right you see them all right it says Aztecs will appear and go through their various acquired accomplishments accompanied by the guardian who will deal uh, detail the history of these marvelous beings all right marvelous beings all right and again the Aztec Lilliputans all right you see them right here in this image again over here see how they're being worshipped all right by other Indians all right so again Lilliputans and this is from the Harvard Theater Collection all right Robert D. Aguirre, who receives his PhD from Harvard, teaches in the English Department of Wayne State University. All right, that was his collection right there. The Aztec Lilliputans, all right? And uh, just one more, we're here in the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum of London. All right, they got this image right here. I'm just gonna show you a close-up of it. And this is the close-up of the image right here. Leicester Square, Linwood Gallery says, the Aztec Lilliputans and the Earthmen. Grand Fashion Exhibition of the Aztec Lilliputans and Urban Ninjas, the two the two new races of people, are right, in Queen's Concert Room, it says here. All right, so admission, and you see the images, all right? What are they showing you right here? They're showing you so-called Negroes as Indians, right? All right, so again, Lilliputans, they're showing them right here being worshiped, they're little guys right here, all right? So the last Aztecs, right? All right, so take a look at these last uh, Aztecs. This is from the Welcome Collection. All right, and we're gonna learn that these uh, two people were called Maximo and Bartola, all right? Maximo and Bartola, all right? The Aztecs, all right? So just zoomed in a little bit so you can see what they're portrayed as here. Let me zoom in some more. As you can see, what are these? These are so-called Negroes, right? Look at their Afros. Look at their Afros and how they're depicted here. Again, see them right here. They were brother and sister actually, and they were always depicted as, you know, we'll read, you know, they try to marry them and, you know, show them us as a couple, all right, exhibit them, all right, but you see what they look like? See they're froze, all right? More images of them, all right? As you can see here, who are these people? Who's this guy? Is that Barnum and Bailey? P.T. Barnum? 
All right, so you see the coarse hair, the afros, you see? All right, the so-called so last aesthetics, all right? What we're gonna see about that. We're in the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society, founded in 1791, right? It says, that's uh, their website. It says, Extraordinary Living Wonders, the Aztec Children, because they were also known as the Aztec Children in Boston, all right? This is from Mary uh, Fabis Fabisuski, sorry, Senior Catologer. All right, I just want to read, let me just show you this image first, all right? So it's Extraordinary Living Wonders, an exhibition for a few days only at Copeland Building, 186 Washington Street, corner of Franklin Street, all right? Look how they depict it, all right? See how they're depicted with the temples and the mounds and pyramids behind them? It says, the wonderful and world-renowned Aztec children, a male and female, one supposed to be about 17 and the other 24 years old, said to be the descendants and specimens of a sacerdotal or priest caste now nearly extinct, the ancient Aztec founders of the ruined temples of Central America, as described by John L. Stevens, Esquire, and other Central American travelers. They have arrived at full maturity and are about four feet high, yet their heads are as small as infants. And though they have all the organs of speech, they are unable to utter but a few distinct words of any language, but can make themselves understood by those having them in charge. They have recently arrived from Europe, where they were received and marked favor by all the crowned heads and nobility. So they were exhibited in Europe to all the kings and queens over there. All right, so this uh, post is letting you know they're back in the U.S. from that tour. All right, so the greatest wonders the human race has ever furnished. Indeed, they are admitted by every person who sees them to be the most extraordinary, as well as the most interesting and pleasing human curiosities ever known. And to physiologists and scientific men generally, they are beyond all doubt objects of the deepest interest. They are on exhibition with an African earth woman. All right, so they're traveling with an African earth woman. Again, the Aztec children. Here you go. So back in the article in the... Uh, Massachusetts Historical Society says the remarkable Aztec children. Says in November and December of 1850, for a 25 cents admission fee, uh, 12 and a half cents for children, Bostonians could view two remarkable specimens of the human race known to the world as the Aztec children. Small in stature and clad in Aztec themed costumes, the two were billed as descendants of the specimens of the sacerdotal caste, now nearly extinct, of the ancient Aztec founders of the ruined temples of that country. Their slanted heads resembled illustrations of profile illustrations from Central America ruins that appeared in John Lloyd Stevens' bestseller Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chapels, and Yucatan. To make the illusions complete, a fantastical account of their origins was sold at the children's appearances entitled Memoir of an Eventful Expedition in Central America, resulting in the discovery of the idol idolatrous city of Ichi Mai. All right, so we're going to get into these two books mentioned here. All right. Continuing in the article, it says, in addition to their popularity with audiences, the two also attracted much attention from the medical and phrenological communities. After their visit in Boston in 1850, Dr. Jonathan Mason Warren published an illustrated article on the pair in the American Journal of the Medical Sciences, which was later issued as a pamphlet. Choosing to stick to the facts, Warren identified the children as Indian dwarfs. So who was the children? They were Indian Indian dwarfs. All right, so can we rule anything out that says that they are African? That's why they got Afros, or they look so-called Negro because they're ex-slaves or descendants of some slaves mixed with Indian. No, these were Indian dwarfs. Are right, you gonna see throughout the video? There's nothing mentioned about Africans. All right, so again, this doctor from the American Journal of Medical Sciences is telling you that they were Indian dwarfs clearly not crediting the story of their semi-divine origins. Warren minutely describes their physical characteristics down to their slightly webbed fingers and their posture which may well be compared to that of some of the simian tribe. You see that? Simian means monkeys. They're comparing them to monkeys, this doctor, all right? But he said they were Indian dwarfs, all right? Of their intellectual capability, Warren observed that they were quite imitative, but with regard to any communication by science or language which they may have with each other, it appears to be not much greater than what might be expected from two intelligent individuals of the canine race. You hear that? Warren goes on to compare the size of their heads to that of infants, idiotic children, chimpanzees, and orangutans. 
concluding that the Aztec children, although a very low mental organization, cannot be pronounced idiots of the lowest grade. Massachusetts Historical Society, this is a so-called Negro girl. All right, do you see this? All right, so we are talking about Indians and we are talking about the aboriginals, the so-called Negro girl, all right? But are these Aztecs or is this story true? All right, about them being of a special priest sacerdotal you know or the last full-blooded aztecs all right let's look into this so we're in the uh, american journal of the medical sciences the one we just uh read about in the other article from the massachusetts historical society i just wanted to show you this is from april 1851 all right so remember after they saw them in boston they wanted to study them all right you're gonna see this article, I'm not going to read it all. I just want to show you some parts, but it's really messed up. They just really talking about them. They measured them. You know, they did, you know, they did studies on them. So I'll just read a little bit here. It says, two children have appeared in Boston so remarkable for their smallness of stature and the peculiarities of their mental faculties that they seem to merit some public notice. I propose to state in the following paper, simple matters of fact, without attempting any speculation in regard to them, all right? Again, this is from by J. Mason Warren, M.D., all right, remember? An account of the two remarkable Indian dwarfs exhibited in Boston. Indian dwarfs, all right, Indian. The children are boy and girl, and from the appearance offered by their dentition, hereafter to be given the former from seven to eight years of age, the latter from four to six. All right, see how young they had them? Allowance being made for a retarded condition of these organs on account of the otherwise abnormal want of development of the whole body. All right, the boy is 33 and 33 quarters inches in height and his weight 20 and 38 pounds. The girl is 29 and a half inches high and her weight 17 pounds. Now listen to this. Their skin is of a dark yellowish cast, a dark yellowish cast. It's lighter than what is generally attributed to the Indian in this part of the country. So check this out. Very important that you, did you listen to that, pay attention to that. So it says that they are dark yellowish cats but still it is lighter than most of the indians in that area so the indians in that area are even darker than them all right again this is what the american journal of the medical sciences letting you know that the indians are dark all right they're dark indians are dark skin in this area all right so their skin is again of a dark yellowish cash lighter than what is generally attributed to the Indians in this part of the country and somewhat darker than that of the mulatto. So even darker than the mulatto though still. All right, so they gave us three hues here. So they gave us mulatto, um, which we usually, you know, think of, you know, a mix or a very light skin, uh, dark person, but they're telling us that they're darker than that, but they're still lighter than the average Indian. So imagine that, you know, the Indians are really dark. They're telling you straight up here, put it two and two together, you know, and be logical what they're telling you right here. They're not being specific, but they're letting you know, all right? The hair of the middle part in rises is an inch distance from the root of the nose, but on each side of fine hair descends quite to the edge of the orbit. In the boy, it is a black coarse, quite stiff, in the girl, wavy and curled, all right? Coarse, wavy and curled, all right? So they continue to talk about them, you know, it's a lot that they go over. They go over their height, see the spine, arm, forearm, hair length. All right, all science stuff, all measurements. They're measuring them like animals, I'm telling you. All right, very disappointed reading this, but you know, that's what they were doing to them at this time. All right, I just wanted to show you, all right, what this, uh, again, American. So I just wanted to show you again, the American Journal of the Medical Science, what they're saying and their study they did on them and letting you know that these are Indian dwarves, Indian, all right? They're darker than mulatto. All right, of a dark yellowish cast. All right, and you see they got coarse hair. All right, you see that what they look like again. All right, all right, so continuing this website, which is the special uh, collections processing at Penn, Penn Libraries. All right, penrare.wordpress.com is the website. Uh, it says Maximo and Bartola and the myth of Ishimaya. I remember they, these. They were supposedly found in this legendary hidden city called Ichimaya. All right. Now, this is posted by Abby Lang, 2014. It says, while cataloging a volume of 19th century anthropologic and ethnographic pamphlets on the Indians of North America, 
This pamphlet jumped out with its typographically festive me message of cultural imperialism and racialization. All right, so they're talking about this pamphlet or book right here, um, which we have. Let me just show you. And this pa plays an important role uh, with these two individuals, these so-called last Aztecs. All right, so the title of this book is it says Illustrated Memoir of an Eventful Expedition into the Central America, resulting in the discovery of the adult Lutra city of Ichimaya in an unexplored region in the possession of two remarkable Aztec children, Maximo the man and Bartolo the girl, descendants and specimens of the sacerdotal caste, now nearly extent of the ancient Aztec founders of the ruined temples of that country, described by John L. Stevens Esquire. All right, so they're using this guy's work, which is another book, to try to um, basically justify what they're going to say in this book. All right, so again, this is given the authorship, it says translated from the Spanish of Pedro Velasquez of San Salvador. This is the supposed author of this book, all right, an expedition he supposedly did, all right. So this is the book again, continuing. Cataloging this pamphlet turned up an extremely sad history involving the kidnapping of two children from El Salvador. 19th century conceptions of race and disability in American Europe and P.T. Barnum and the American Circus Freak Show. All right, so P.T. Barnum is involved in all this, all right? The pamphlet memoir of an eventful expedition in Central America helps tell the story of the construction of racial and ethnic others during the period of the birth of American anthropology. The idolatrous city of Ishimaya, as well as the author of the pamphlet, Pedro Velasquez, are both imaginary, all right? They're both what? Imaginary. Ishimaya doesn't exist. I looked into it. It really doesn't. All right. The inspiration for the Maya city and this fictitious memoir was John Lloyd Stevens' 1841 seminal travel account incidents of travels in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, illustrated by Frederick Catherwood. All right. So they're saying that they got their idea for this story, right? From the so-called Pedro Velasquez, which is imaginary, all right? All that is imaginary. They got it from this other book, a real expedition that was done by uh, John Lloyd Stevens in 1841, which is this book right here, all right? We got it right here in the uh, archive.org. All right, so this is the book. All right, again, again, Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan by John L. Stevens, author of Incidents of Travel in Egypt, Arabia Petra, and the Holy Land, etc. This is volume one. All right, so very good book. Got two of his volumes. I actually have these. I was reading along, and I'm going to read from them in the future videos. There's a lot of good information here. He was one of the first to explore those regions, all right? after certain key people like he was like the fourth or fifth you know key person to go there all right and explore these regions you know so he has a lot a lot of info in this book has nothing to do with no fairy tales or anything like that what we're going to expose right now but they try to use his book and some of his phrases to try to um, basically uh, benefit their uh, false story so they can go along with helping and enslave and uh, exhibit really these two pe persons we're about to find out all right so-called last astics all right so so again back to the article we were just reading again they're telling us that their inspiration was uh, uh john lloyd stevens book all right that we just saw so stevens was a travel writer from new york city who along with catterwood spent the years of 1839 to 1843 traveling in mexico and central america Stevens provides grandiloquent descriptions of ancient Maya ruins and the indigenous communities they encountered. And accompanied by Catterwood's precise architectural engravings, the text was an early introduction to the ruins of Maya cities for, an, for a mesmerized North American and European audience. As told in incidents of travel in Central America, on their way to the ruins of Palenque in southern Mexico, Stevens and Catterwood hear a story from an old padre or an old priest of an ancient city occupied by candones or unbaptized Indians, meaning they haven't been conquered, who live as their fathers did, acknowledging no submission to the Spaniards. And the government of Central America does not pretend to exercise any control over them. This city could allegedly be seen from a distance from the top of the neighboring Sierra, but no white man had ever set forth within the city 
as the inhabitants are aware that a race of strangers has conquered the whole country around and murder any white man who attempts to enter their territory. So this is again in Stephen's book. We just saw this one right here. All right. So they're quoting him again. It's page, this is on volume two, page 195. All right. Now continues as Stevens and Caterwood couldn't deviate from their itinerary and take the time to reach the city or even to climb the highest ridge of, of the Sierra to see the mysterious city below. They had heard of another explorer who did reach the top of the ridge only to find that the city obscured by clouds cover and the old padre had seen it from afar. So the interests were definitely piqued. The interest awakened in us was the most thrilling I ever experienced. One look at that city was worth 10 years of an everyday life. So again, the Corinne Stevens, volume two of his book, but uh, they're letting you know here that he actually never saw no city or even been to anybody. He never mentioned that about Ishimaya or anything like that. All right. So this is from uh, the book. Uh, again, the illustrations, you know, the fake story. All right. Let me show you it's in here. All right. Let me just go to that page right here. All right, here it is again. It's a, it's a, you know, looking to the side, but it's the same one we're seeing uh, right here in the article. All right, so this is a fake story. It's, it's fiction. All right, we're gonna keep, we're gonna see that now. It says, this is an image of Ichimai discovered from the Sierra Nevada from the 1853 expedition of Illustrated Memoir of an Adventure Expedition in Central America. All right, so it says Stevens speculated that two young men of good constitution and who could afford to spend five years might succeed in reaching the city. All right. This is where our pamphlet, Memoir of an Eventful Expedition in Central America, picks up the story. So they just grab from there, right? They're saying that they continued the story that uh, John Stevens was probably mentioning, uh, which was that, that there was might be a city there with Indians, but it never really specifically went to one, right? So they're telling you that the pamphlet, the other one, picks up from there. With the introduction of the very two men equipped to reach Ishimaya, Mr. Hortiz and Mr. Hammond. This fictional narrative follows the two men on their travels from Belize to the mythic Maya city supposedly located in Chiapas, meeting Senor Pedro Velasquez of San Salvador along the way. Velasquez acts as their guide and also keeps a manuscript journal of the journey, which is supposedly translated into memoir of an eventful expedition in Central America. All right. So the pamphlet describes the discovery of Ichimaya, as well as of two small children kept within the city, the surviving remnant of an ancient and singular order of priesthood called Kanas, Kanas, which had accompanied the first migration of this people from the Assyrian plains. Hmm. Velasquez 31, the Ishimayans held the remaining members of this race in veneration as living specimens of an antique race so nearly extinct. The legend of the Mayas of Ichimaya killing all white intruders was upheld in this account and only Velasquez leaves alive, kidnapping the Cana sister and brother and returning to El Salvador. All right, so they made a whole movie about it. All right, to, to, so you'll see why. <laughs> so Velasquez describes the children as diminutive in stature and embezzled in intellect, but also as the greatest ethnological curiosities in living form as specimens of an absolutely unique and nearly extinct race of mankind that they claim the attention of physiologists and all men of science. According to the memoir of an eventful expedition in Central America, Velasquez sends the children at the ages of 8 and 10 to the United States to exhibit them as specimens of this almost lost race. All right, so this is an image from that book that we have. All right, so they try to say that these are the same people depicted in the Amaya walls. All right, that's what they were trying to show and make people believe. The two children became known to the world as Maximo and Bartola Velasquez, or the Aztec children, and performed in circus freak shows for four decades. This pamphlet was published possibly for P.T. Barnum. Really, it was published for him as a promotional piece for exhibits of the Aztec children to arouse curiosity in these living specimens from ancient Mesoamerica, all right? So that story of them being uh, the last Aztec children is false, all right? It was a, a promotional piece done for P.T. Barnum, all right? All right, this is them again dressed up. See how they dress him up with the sun thing on him? All right, you see the froze? All right, these are Indians. Indians, still Indians, just because their um, origin story was made up, they're still Indians from El Salvador. 
All right. The stories of the discovery at Ichimaya and the race are fictitious and true. The children suffer from microcephaly. Microcephaly, you see, they had this disease, a neurodevelopmental disorder that resulted in reduced head size and impaired intellectual development and possibly dwarfism. All right. They were found in the 1840s in a small village in the state of San Miguel, El Salvador, by a Spanish trader named Ramon Selva, who promised their parents to bring them to the United States for treatment of their condition, but instead sold them to a promoter named Morris. All right. The physical attributes of their disorder were exploited in order to build them as the remarkable Aztec children. Descendants and specimens of the sacerdotal caste, now nearly extinct, of the ancient Aztec founders of the ruined temples of that country. Morris and others compared their look as strikingly similar to engravings in Stevens' incidents of travel in Central America. Chapels in Yucatan of ancient Mayas depicted in stone within various Maya, Maya ruins. It is unclear why these children were referred to Aztec rather than Maya. So even though they found them in a supposed Maya, even the story is messed up because the, they supposedly found them in a Maya city, but they're calling them Aztec. See, they're pointing that out to you. But presumably Aztec was being used to mean pro-Columbian Mexican in general, as was common in the 19th century. Dressed in pseudo-Aztec costumes, the Aztec children first appeared in the U.S. in the early 1850s to an electrified American public and medical community. The mayor of Boston attended and promoted an early appearance of the children there. They were brought before the Boston Society of Natural History, and papers about them appeared in subsequent years in medical journals such as the American, the American Journal of Medical Sciences, All right, we just read that one, right, and The, La the Lancet. Members of the Senate and House of Representatives met with Maximo and Bartola, and they were invited to the White House to meet President Millard Fillmore. In 1853, they were taken to England by Morris, built there as the Aztec Lilliputans. They were exhibited at the Ethnological Society and met the royal family at Buckingham Palace before continuing a tour of Europe and meeting with other royal families. All right. The Aztec children were not only sold into a life of sideshows performance, but they were also subjected to medical tests and ethnological examinations and cranial measurements in order to study their racial traits. The scientific community eventually dis discredited the pamphlets and Barnum's assertion of their pure race, despite their racial status lowered to that of mestizos. So they, they after they realized it was fiction, they called them mestizos, right? What is that keyword for? Indians. They continued to draw crowds at Barnum's Circus until fading to obscurity near the turn of the century. Here's another image of them, so-called Negroes, right? You see the air froze. So again, Maximum Bartola, all right, also known as Maximum Valdez Nunez and Bartola Velasquez, respectively, for the stage names of two Salvadorian siblings, both suffering from microcephaly and cognitive developmental disability, who were exhibited in human zoos in the 19th century, originally from, from near Usulutan, a very indigenous part of, of uh, you know, El Salvador. The siblings were given by their mother to a merchant who promised he would take them to Granada to be educated and exhibited. Then they went through several guardians afterwards. They were eventually billed as the Aztec children. An elaborate story was constructed of how they were found in the temple of a lost Mesoamerican city. They toured the U.S. and Europe, appearing before various regions and dignitaries. All right. So before we end the video, I just wanted to read uh, finally from this article. I found from a newspaper, the El Government of Salvador's Gazette or newspaper from 1853, November 4th, 1853, all right? And they had an article regarding the, these, these two individuals, uh, the Aztec children, right? So I want to go down to that uh, page here. So this is the part of the article I want to read to you, all right, which I found here. I'm glad I found this because it verifies and correlates with everything. All right, so it says here, I'm a, it's in Spanish, all right? I want you to go ahead and uh, if, if you want to get a, uh, an expert in Spanish to verify if I'm translating it correctly, go ahead. You know, I did my best to translate it. You know, you can trust me or not, but I am truly translating it as much as I could, uh, you know, the right way. So it starts out, ¿Cómo se abusa del, pu del público? Or how do they abuse the public? So I'm just going to read in English as I go along, all right? So it says, in the Costa Rican Gazette of October 8th, we previously reproduced an article from the Times relative to two young persons whom speculators in their exhibition 
have baptized with the classification of the Aztec Lilliputans. All right. The observations of the Costa Rican Gazette over this matter are open to judgment as past full of salt and more would have said about this the wording if when he wrote had been aware of the data we are going to communicate to our readers all right so they're saying that they're missing some data in that uh, publication of the Costa Rican Gazette all right so they're about to correct them remember we're reading from El Salvadoran Gazette and they're kind of mad at what happened and what they're reading in these other newspapers in this time about these two people all right that says before anything ante tos cosas before anything we declare as Central Americans moderately educated in the geography of our country the city of Ichimaya its towers castles and golden minerals are a tale of the Arabian Nights as well as the Aztec Lilliputans of the priestly race all right these are tales letting you this is fake they're not Lilliputan Aztec priest in Ichimaya does not exist all right Los dos muchachos, or the two young persons that are now being exhibited in Europe, remember, 1853, are not Lilliputans, nor Aztecs, nor priests, nor natives of Ichimaya, nor belong to any other race apart from man, or natives of the Republic of Guatemala, because there's some stories that they were Guatemalans, all right? But, it says, in the department of San Miguel, in a place called La Puerta, La Puerta, which in Spanish actually means the door or Puerta, right? Near the village of Usulutan lives a mulata. A mulata, mulata. What do we know about mulata? Keyword for Indian most of the time. Married mother of these two children that passed between us like a phenomenon. As it happens that such another son that the same woman has identified the first two. So th she had another son who they were able to verify those were her brothers. The other son verified those were her brothers or the first two that came, all right? And that they would surely pass as Aztec Lilliputans if any merchant would become owner of them. Mr. Raimundo Selva, a native of Nicaragua, wanton to speculate with these rare children. He got them from the mother by means of a few ounces of gold four or five years ago. And thus, once obtained, he went with them to the United States, taking with him also a wolf, a white deer, and some titias monkeys. Arriving at San Juan in Nicaragua, we don't know how he was stripped by an American of all those curiosities and had therefore this caused some other troubles. After this, Mr. Ignacio Cepeda, Ignacio Cepeda, agent of Mr. Silva, solicited from the government of the state of El Salvador documents to verify the property of its cost in the boys and animals. And in fact, the Ministry of Relations authenticated the information presented by Cepeda. We do not know if Mr. Silva gets, re gets uh, his things recovered. So this article continues, such as the true story of the Aztec Lilliputans or so-called Aztec Lilliputans. And we believe in feeling a duty of conscience informing the world about its precedents and native place in San Salvador, all right? So they wanted to make sure and clear the air, let everybody know that these two individuals are not from no mythical a city called Ichimaya. They're not the last asset. They're actually Salvadoran, all right? They were sold by their mom to this merchant, all right? The uh, Salvador Gazette from 1853, letting you know these were Salvadorans. As the American Journal, of the medical sciences told us from 1851 that these are two remarkable Indian dwarves. They're Indian. The so-called Negroes are Indian still. All right. So again, these two, um, you know, aboriginals from El Salvador, you know, they got, you know, bought from their mom. I guess she was. I don't know the reason. We don't know what they, what she was told, or why she even did it. You know, but you know, they, unfortunately, they were sold to these people who just wanted to take advantage of them, not help them. You know, exhibit them around the world as freaks, you know, in freak shows and P.T. Barnum and Bailey had a big role in this. In fact, just wanted to show you something here. And it says uh, from the Catterwood Projects, Incidents of Visual Reconstructions and Other Matters. That's the name of the book. Let me just zoom in here. This now says over here, hoping to capitalize on the publication success, P.T. Barnum 
perpetuated a hoax published in a spurious memoir of an eventful expedition in Central America. All right, so it says that P.T. Barnum was the actual person who wrote that pamphlet under a pseudo a pseudonym, and he exhibited a pair of midgets as human specimens from this voyage. The Enterprise and Showman brought these two individuals to New York and London, where they were displayed as, as two remarkable Aztec children, Maximo the man and Bartola the girl, descendants and specimens of the sacerdotal caste, now nearly extinct, of the ancient Aztec founders of the ruined temples of that country, described by John L. Stevens. As it says here in uh, the Smithsonian uh, Magazine.com, says P.T. Barnum isn't the hero, the greatest showman wants you to think. I know his movie just came out, but you know, the truth is he was, you know, exhibiting children around uh, like animals. And it says down here, further down, further down in the article, it says similar racial or othering permeated the rest of Barnum's living curiosities from the Aztec children who were actually from El Salvador. They were actually Salvadoran to the real but exoticized Siamese twins. All right, so they didn't, you know, Smithsonian that they were actually from Salvador, right? It was very messed up what happened to these two individuals. You know, uh, you know, they were exhibited as, you know, little people, uh, like a different race, you know, like they were animals. All right, you know, and, and it was just for money. It was just for entertainment. They didn't care about them, how they felt. They must have had a horrible life. This is right here in the Princeton University Art Museum. You can see the Aztec Lilliputans again. Again, but these were, you know, two human beings, aboriginals. And even though they had, you know, this disease, they were humans. They shouldn't have been treated like that. You need to know the real history. I just wanted to do this video so you guys can know the true history of these two individuals. So now when you see the images online, you know the real background and honor them, you know, honor them. Because as you can see, these are so-called Negroes. Look at them. Look at them. All right, these are aboriginals. Even though the story of them being Aztec, the last Aztec is fake, they're still Indians from El Salvador. All right, possibly could be Maya and Aztec, but you know, they have, there's a different story behind this, all right? 